Hi guys, welcome back to Be Your Own Best Coach with JJ. Today, I'm interviewing the Executive Director of McKay Women's Services and author, Dr. Anne Butcher. Now, Dr. Anne Butcher is a wife, mother and grandmother, a professional social worker with over 30 years of experience working in the social welfare fields of community development, youth development, youth justice, child protection, and disability services. She has also gained extensive working experience when managing domestic violence and sexual assault counseling services and women's health and wellbeing programs. And in an in-demand, engaging and personable speaker, Anne is regularly asked to speak at conferences or significant community events such as International Women's Day or to a range of other women's groups, service clubs and other community groups. And is passionate about seeing people, particularly girls and women, be their best so they can succeed in all areas of their lives and reach their fullest potential, whatever that may be for them. So welcome, Anne, Dr. Anne Butcher. <laughs> thank you so you? much. <laughs> thank you, Janelle. I'm really well, thank you. I'm thank so you. excited to be able to interview you today and there's so much I want to ask you and I know that you're, you've had this amazing career from you know and it's interesting when I see people's careers it, it says a lot about them and so your, your career stems from child safety, disability services, helping women in regards to sexual assault or domestic violence. I mean that says a lot about who you are and, and how you want to help people and I love that. And you've also got a brilliant book that you've yes. written. So we're going to, going to delve into that a little bit later. But tell me about how did you get into the, the human services, the social work that you do? What made you want to get into that? Well, it uh, happened, you know, quite a long time ago. Um, and I started to, it was actually after we'd had our, you know, our youngest child and, um, and, the the children were sort of I was thinking okay we've we've got our family now um, I know that um, I do want to do something more with my life well um, I mean being a mum was you know it was wonderful but it, I didn't find it to be as um, mentally fulfilling and stimulating as I felt I needed so I started to question myself and have a conversation with myself about well, what is it I want to do, you know? And um, so I was in my like mid twenties at this time and um, started to think about, you know, asking myself questions. What am I good at? What am I not good at? What do I like? What don't I like? And I came up with, um, I like people and I like trying, I like to see people get ahead. And also I'm not good at maths. So therefore, <laughs> <laughs> therefore, I won't head towards a maths and science kind of career. I'll um, head more towards a people sort of career. So I decided then that I would um, uh, start to do some study. And I mean, I had some conversations with people and that led me to look at look into courses and steered me in, in that direction, I suppose. And I ultimately decided I wanted to, to study social work. So um, I did study social work over many years while I was raising a family, working, um, and I just loved it. I just loved and found it was really my calling and it was, you know, there wasn't anything at all I didn't like about it. It was just so fulfilling and rewarding and, um, you know, to feel that you can, it's a real privilege to be able to feel that you can actually um, play some, some part, some small part in seeing other people uh, get on in their lives, you know, no matter what, what they've experienced. And, so that's kind of what got me into this space. And um, so I did study, did, did complete my degrees and, um, and entered this field of work, which I've been working in now for like over 30 years. And I just loved it. Wow. Yeah. And I can imagine, you know, with, with working with from child safety to the disability service to sexual assault and domestic violence, it, it must be, there must be so many moments that are challenging working in that environment what has oh. been the biggest challenges that stick in your mind yeah oh absolutely there have been numerous challenges yeah. um look you know this is some sometimes you get confronted with situations where your own values and your own ethics are really challenged they've probably been some of my most challenging times when you know working for a government department and the government 
you know, that government department has certain policies and procedures that, that need to be, and laws, you know, statutory laws that need to be um, followed. And sometimes it's very challenging when um, at a human level, you know, you really want to um, take some course of action or do something to support someone, but because of legislation or policies, you're not able to. And I think that really causes you to question what you're doing, why you're doing it. Um, and, you know, sometimes if you can, if you can navigate those ethical dilemmas, um, you know, you can continue on. Sometimes, sometimes it's not possible and you, and you may realise that you just, it's time to leave or time to move on, you know. Yeah. So um, working in the field of statutory child protection uh, was an extremely confronting um, area to work in, a, a really difficult area to work in, um, particularly, you know, as a parent myself. Um, yeah, that was probably the, the most difficult, complex field of practice I've ever worked in, really. But yeah. also, also, you know, rewarding. And it's a shame because there are a lot of good stories that unfortunately never make it, you know, to see the light of day. Um, we often hear the, the stories where things go terribly wrong and that's tragic, absolutely dreadful and tragic when those things happen. But there are a lot of times, I know, in my career when I worked with um, families to help them to get their children back, um, either with the parents themselves yeah. or if not if that wasn't possible because of their life circumstances then within that child's extended family uncles aunts grandparents you know others so that they grew up with a sense of self-identity within that extended family and knowing where they fit you know which is so important to every one of us really yeah that that human connection and then the need to be loved and wanted and uh, you know um yes self-worth with uh, so so in regards to um, what you what you've done in the past, how has that helped you to grow as a person? Mm -hmm. Well, it's helped me enormously. <laughs> um, it's helped me to see life from different vantage points. It's helped me to appreciate, you know, my life, my my own family, my own children. You know, um, the family life that I was born into, and. Um, you know, the things that I've experienced, it's made me appreciate what I have. Um, it, you know, it, it's also um, made me realise that some people, um, there's circumstances, you know, children are born into circumstances sometimes that um, are really, you just know from day one that that child's going to be up against a really difficult time, you know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's taught me to, you know, put things into perspective in terms of my own life, in terms of the life that we have majority of people have in this country you know compared to other countries in the world and uh yeah i think it's just helped me to become quite grounded and and balanced and uh in my own life and and um uh, and in my own you know the work that i do with people and to not be too quick to judge and um just be more tolerant i think of of differing differing perspectives yeah yeah with what are you most proud? I know there'd be lots of lots of times where you, you are, you know, really, uh, you know, happy with what what's the results that that um, you get. But what's something that you're really proud of in your career? Well, I, I think I'm proud that I've actually stepped into this field of practice yeah. because because no matter what I do, whether it's in a whether it's been in a frontline practitioner or working directly with clients with you know with people to help them in their life or whether it's been more as I've moved through my career into management roles and leadership roles to mentor and support you know younger um, social workers and social welfare professionals who are coming through uh, up through the ranks and to see them get on in their careers and and um, see the wonderful work that they do every day with clients you know in, in my current role um, as executive director for Mackay Women's Services where we operate um, what's called a domestic and family violence high risk team. Um, I see, you know, every week, I see the, the fabulous work that that team does in keeping women and children safe yeah. or safer, yeah. And um, so it's really difficult to choose just one thing that I might be proud of because there's so many of them. But I think, it, you know, probably the proudest is the fact that I moved into this profession at all to be able to yeah. touch um, so many lives um, to be privileged to be able to be able to do that has been um, just a, a real privilege. Yeah. 
Yeah, wonderful. So, so along the way, have you had any mentors, Anne? Because I could, could see that it would be quite challenging what you do to be faced with, you know, there'd be a lot of things that you face with that are really, really challenging. Have you had any mentors along the way in your career, in your 30 years? Oh, I have had some wonderful mentors, right. you know, and, and it's my, um, my experience and my belief that, you know, any of us who achieve in our careers or in our life, in our life goals, none of us do it on our own. You know, there's always someone, you know, people who are behind you supporting you or mentoring you along the way. So, yes, I've had, my, you know, to begin with, I suppose my most, you know, first mentor I ever had was my mother. I mean, she was a really strong, strong woman and um, uh, she taught me a lot uh, about um, how to be resilient and, um, you know, so that really set me off on a good on a good footing, I suppose. And then from that, from there, I've had um, different managers in my career in the public service who have been very um, generous with their time and um, and have I've had some really good discussions with them, you know, um, about decisions that maybe they've made and they've helped me understand, look at things from different perspectives. So I've had some really wonderful mentors. I've had another mentor who is um, a professor at... Um, well, she's actually retired now. She's an emeritus professor um, in the field of social work. And she has been um, absolutely, uh, uh, absolutely wonderful mentor to me. Yeah. She's, uh, she's really guided and supervised me through doing um, research, my honours research and my PhD research. Um, so she's really helped me to develop skills and depth of understanding in different um, so of different social issues that I've been researching. So I, I count myself as extremely fortunate to have met such wonderful and very generous people with their time and their knowledge and their wisdom. Um, and I've also been very open to learn from them as well. So yeah, um, yeah it's worked out well for me, I think in the long run. Yeah. Beautiful. In regards to, because and, and with your role, is that based, is it nationally based or is it, because I know you're in um, in Queensland at the moment. Um, That's right. Yeah, are you based, is it just based in Queensland or is it, is it a national? No, it's, um. so I'm actually uh, executive director for a service, a yeah. non-government non organisation that's based yeah. in, in Mackay in Queensland. Yeah. Um, and I, uh, I manage the services that are here, domestic violence, sexual assault, women's health, health and wellbeing services. And there's also men's uh, behaviour change and men's perpetrator programs in there as right. well. Great. Yeah. We don't hear much about that, though, in the, in the public. Like, I haven't heard much about that at all. Yeah, so um, yeah. With, all, with all of the reforms that have happened in recent years um, in, the, in the field of domestic and family violence, governments have made more funding available to establish men's behaviour change programs, men's perpetrator programs. Yeah. And that's absolutely wonderful because I, you know, unless you start to work with men, I mean, you're only working with half of the kind of situation that you yeah. need to work with. Yeah. So, um, so yes, we actually employ, I employ a male counsellor and he works with um, with men who are referred to the program, um, maybe through the courts or through probation and parole. Um, some men can self-refer, but we find most of them come from police courts or probation and parole. Um, and then then the work the work starts with them to help them um, understand and look at different ways that they can have you know relationships that are healthy and positive and respectful um, with with partners. So yeah, Wonderful. so if that. Yeah, that is a really wonderful thing that's only happened in recent years. Yeah, that's fabulous. And coming from uh, coming from when I was seventeen, I was in a domestic violence situation. So, so being able to have someone, uh, you know, that you can have that support with. And I know right now, as soon as COVID happened in March, my my initial first thoughts was, oh my goodness, how. How are we going to be protecting those people in regards to domestic violence? Because uh, I know for me, when I was 17, there were times when I felt trapped when I was 17, but I could still get out of the house. Yeah. And so how has COVID, how has that affected the, you know, what's happening out there in regards to domestic violence and uh, you know, I, I, can, I can imagine that the, the figures would be increasing because people are trapped 
And it's also a volatile situation because people are losing their jobs and, uh, you know, how, how's, how's yeah. it um, affected? Oh, absolutely. So um, what we've actually seen is when there was, you know, the lockdowns, when people were let much more restricted in their ability to get out of the houses, yeah. um, there were... We, you know, we were we were receiving phone calls for assistance. Um, we were receiving a lot a lot of phone calls from women who have never ever reached out to our services before. Yeah. So, and what we noticed was a lot of them were younger women, and we we kind of thought that they may have been probably women who may have um, previously worked in maybe hospitality or retail. You know, those kind of um, those industries that lost, you know, were first to sort of be put off, I suppose, or closed down because of, because of COVID. Um, so our numbers, our data um, actually doubled wow. um, in, in the, in the, you know, first quarter um, from, from March to the end of June. And um, we've actually received some additional um, one-off COVID funding to help us to try and uh, Meet, meet the level of demand. So we're putting on additional temporary staff because the level of demand is significantly increased, really gone through the roof. And yeah. everyone is just, you know, flat out with trying to do the best we can with um, providing counselling supports and court support to women and to children. We provide counselling to children and adolescents as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we just run off our feet, which is sad that we are. But um, I think with COVID, you know, affecting people losing jobs, affect i mean obviously um yeah the, the relationship has there has to be the basis to the relationship that probably was a domestically violent relationship to begin with and um and with domestic violence i mean most people think of domestic violence as physical violence but it's so much more than that i mean it's really about coercion and control of one person wanting to control another so yeah. when when you're you know when you're locked in a in a house together or you're in a house together and neither can kind of get away or, or you know, have some space to yeah. themselves. And then you've got children who are home, you're trying to homeschool children. Um, it's just, you know, it's like a perfect storm of, yeah. um, of, of a situation that can just go terribly wrong. So, yeah. so we did see an increased number of domestic violence cases and, and of incidents that were um, more severe than what we normally see. Yeah, um, yeah so sadly, it, it's it has gone, um, the, the data has actually you know doubled really for us yeah yeah because yeah. mm -hmm. I, mean, I suppose any any issues that, that, that people already had be amplified that's right yes and, and so it's amplifying that and uh yeah so well fortunately yes. they've got the support of you guys um that uh, can help yeah. you know with yes and, uh, in regards to in those situations uh, and I've worked with a lot of people and I've got a few co podcasts actually in regards to people that have gone through uh, domestic violence. One person nearly died. Um, she had her, half her face um, hit with a baseball bat um, and she yeah. had to have her whole face reconstructed. Um, so it's, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. It's, it's, um, but it's horrific. It yeah. Is. So, yeah. Yeah, so yes, it's good and got your support. Yes, it's good that we're here and we can support, yeah. but we do we do see some really complex and um, yeah, really yeah, severe incidents of domestic violence. But yep, yeah, it's good that we're here to help. The, better than not having services available to help. Yeah. That's what would you say to someone in that position right now that they're you know if they're feeling stuck, if they're feeling because sometimes I know for me when I was and you know I was only seventeen and I didn't live with with the person i lived with my mum but i was quite embarrassed yes and i remember feeling that i remember feeling embarrassed and i my family still don't know the intensity of what happened because i never discussed it i never told them at the time and yes it's i've been you know older that i've expressed it for my clients and um and for myself but i remember there was this this shame almost that that was attached to being in that situation so what would you say to the people that are in a situation right now and and are not getting support what would you say to them well a couple of things there's there certainly are support services available so reach out reach out for help so in in australia from anywhere in australia um there's a 1800 respect dial 1800 respect and they will help um, if you're in Queensland, 
um, there's DV Connect, which is um, 1-800-811-811. Um, and that's for men and women can, can call those numbers. Um, and, you know, in our area, obviously our service in, in the Mackay region, we're here to assist. But yeah. um, I think it's important for anyone in that situation to know that we understand, those of us who work in this field, we understand that it's um, something that a lot of people feel embarrassed about. Yeah. Um, we don't judge anyone. We know that on average, um, someone who's in a domestic violence relationship will attempt to leave that relationship on average about eight times before they finally actually do leave that relationship. Yeah. So we are, we are helping or we are assisting and supporting women um, who, who, you know, reach a point where they decide they need, they reach out for help and they decide they're going to leave and then they might decide for, you know, a range of reasons that they're going to go back and that's perfectly fine. That's their decision to make. And I think that anyone in that situation needs to understand that, um, that we, we know, we understand um, that there's a lot of things to consider in those situations and we don't we make no judgment about anyone who goes back many times and we'll, we'll still be here to help and that's whether that's our service or any of those other statewide or national services we understand yeah that's a beautiful thing to know because you know there might be fear around that going oh i don't know what to do i might be and so it's you know because people think you know i've got to do the right thing um yes. so that's really good to know that there's no right or wrong just reach out even for a discussion if, if you that's right exactly yeah. yes and yeah, i think exactly. the, the other thing that sometimes we don't think about and you mentioned this is the kids and even the animals yes you know it, Absolutely. yeah how 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 kids and animals can be affected. Um, Definitely. So we yeah. see, you know, we provide counselling and support to children from the age of four to 17, males and females. And um, yes, children are really impacted by trauma when they've been living in a, a household that, where there's domestic violence um, in, within the household. And it really does have a significant effect on children. Um, it, the effects of trauma um, stay with children for, for their lifetime if it's not addressed you know so um it's really important that children and a lot of times parents you know or adults in those children's lives think that the children don't know what's going on they think that oh the kids were asleep they wouldn't have heard it you know the kids don't know kids do know yeah <laughs> they, they do pick up on it um even if it's just the um you know the tension sometimes it might not even be a spoken word or something happening but it's the it's the the tension that's in the air that children pick up on yeah yeah absolutely well mm. now i want to find out about your amazing book now and it's yes. called i ruined my life or so they said <laughs> and i love that i love the uh, what it's called i ruined my life or so they said so yes. tell me about your book okay so um it's it's funny how this came about. So oh, maybe about 15 years ago, I know my husband said to me about 15 years ago, oh, you know, you should, you should think about writing a book one day. And I just sort of laughed it off and said, yeah, sure. Like who would want to, who would want to, you know, read my story. <laughs> so um, anyway, kind of stayed in the back of my mind. And then I've had a couple of other close friends who've known me all my life, who've sort of s said the same sort of thing. So it kind of got me thinking. And then, um, then um, Natasha Denman came to Mackay, N N Natasha and Stu, the Ultimate 48 Hour Author um, yeah. Publishing Company. There. And I went along just out of curiosity to one of their half day workshops. And after attending the workshop, I left there and I thought, I am going to do this. Yes, <laughs> it, is some it is something I sh I've thought about for a very long time and I'm going to actually do it now. Yeah. So I made that commitment to myself. And it's a really scary thing to do when you write a memoir because you're kind of really, you, you're burying your soul, you know. And, yeah. um, but anyway, I've reached the stage where I'm in my life where I think, you know what, um, I've, lived, I've lived this life and I can't unlive it. So... Um, <laughs> So, so I'm going to, I'm going to write about it now in the hope that it will, um, that the, the things that I've learned in my life will also be helpful, um, to other women and girls and women actually. Yeah. So, um, that's the reason that I wrote it. Um, some chapters were easier to write than others because of, you know, different events that occurred in my life. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but, um, it's done now. It's the book is, is written and, um, hey. Yes, and um, we've, we've pressed the, um, you know, bulk print button, so that they'll be arriving soon. 
fabulous. Was it a healing process for you, Anne, writing the book? Um, not really. I, and I say that because um, I've had many, many years to kind of work on myself, as it were, um, particularly when I was studying social work. I mean, that was probably more therapeutic to me than anything else, because when you're studying and thinking about thinking deeply about what you're learning, you can't help but apply that to yourself and your own circumstances in your own life. Yes. So I did, I suppose over many years, I did a lot of self therapy, but I also lot, lots of my friends and colleagues are social workers. So I had, I had numerous conversations with um, other professionals in this field. So yes. I feel like I've, I've had like many years of therapy, <laughs> 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 but, um, um, when I actually sat down to write the book, um, I think because it had been mulling around in my mind for such a long time um, that when I got, once I got the structure in place of what I was going to write about within each of the chapters, I sat down and it really almost just fell out of me, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. The hard part was just um, making sure that you didn't go off into so many little rabbit holes that you could have gone down, you know, and keep yeah. bringing it back keep bringing it back to hang on what am I writing about you know because yeah. the, the, the temptation is there to want to you know talk about your children or you know what they've done or you know yeah. um but that wasn't the purpose of writing the book so yeah. um what it did help me um what it did help me realize for myself though was when I started to um look back on my life and think about you know why did I go, why did I want to study in the first place? And I did tell you before about why I wanted to study, but there was also another reason that I came to realize and, um, you know, without giving too much away about what's in the book, but there were things that happened earlier in my life that made me, um, want to prove to my father in particular that, um, I could study at university level. And um, so in writing, in writing the book, I realized, you know, I started out on this, on this journey of that's brought me to, to the point that I'm at now because I really wanted to prove some other, to prove to some people that I could do, you know, I could, I could achieve, I can do things. Yeah. And, um, and then um, circumstances happened throughout the years that I was studying and um, when my father passed away and then I had to stop and think, well, well, okay, I was sort of doing it to prove to him that I could do it and now he's not here. So why am I doing it now? And then I yeah. kind of had to really reflect on that and reach the conclusion that I came to the conclusion that, okay, now I'm doing it for myself. I'm doing it to prove it to myself that I can do this, you know? Yeah. And, um, and, it, and what occurred to me in, in only in writing the book was what, you know, part of why am I writing the book? It's like, okay, now I'm doing it for others. Um, I, yeah. So there was like three sort of separate reasons kind of across my life for why I, why I started to study, why I continued to study yeah. and, and why I wanted to write this up, you know, um, yeah. for others. Yeah. So, so it's like this onion and unraveling <laughs> as you're writing the book. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Yeah. That's beautiful. What do you want someone to get out of when they're reading your book? What do you want to leave them with? Okay, I, want, I really want them to, to have a think about for themselves what, where, what is their inner resilience? What's, where's their inner strength? You know, like, yeah. so if, they, if they've got life goals and they've got things they might have always wanted to do, but they've never really stepped out of their comfort zone and had a go, like, what's holding them back? Is it, is it fear? Often it's fear, fear of, fear of ex burying your soul or fear of failure or fear of success. Or, um, so I really want people to identify their own level of resilience and have a little bit of a chat with themselves about what's, what might be holding them back. But to know that um, nothing is impossible and um, even if they don't know where to start, they simply need to find a person, another person who can help them to find where to start yeah. because that's where those really key people in my life have helped me when I've had an idea or, and I, I didn't know where to start and they would, you know, you have those conversations and it would lead to something that then helps you to move forward to achieve your goals. And that's what I would love for people to achieve their life goals, to feel, find their resilience and to, reach their fullest potential um that to me that's just wonderful i've seen some 
some people do that and it's just so rewarding to see people achieve their achieve to their fullest potential and to know that you've been able to encourage them or mentor them or support them in some way to do that yeah so that's my hope wow that's wonderful and have your have any of your family read your book yet <laughs> no they haven't you know they haven't and how no. are you feeling about it well <laughs> i'm I, i'm feeling okay about it i yeah. um <laughs> yeah yeah i said um I said to my husband, do you want to read me my book? He said, well, I've lived it with you. So <laughs> um, I, I think you might not be sure what I've written about him in it, maybe. <laughs> no, I think that, but in saying that, um, they've, um, they will have told me they want a copy of it. So um, yeah, yeah when, when I get my, um, you know, the box of the bulk order arrives, I'll certainly make sure they get their copies first. Yeah. And how amazing is it that you're going to have these, you know, if you think about your family, that you've got this, this legacy that you've left with them. Oh, yeah. Oh, so so I'm, I'm a bit of a genealogist as well. So I love, I've done family trees and that is absolutely something that stayed with me that, you know, to the thought that um, someone, you know, a relative of mine, a great, 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 whatever grandchild one day might pick up this book and think, oh, what was she like? Oh, that was what she was like. Oh, that's what it was like back in those days, you know, like, um, I think that's nice. And I suppose every one of us wants to leave a little something of ourselves behind just to prove that we were actually here, you know, at yeah. some point in time. <laughs> yeah. So that's my little, my legacy. Love it. Where, where do you see, what vision have you got for yourself? What goals have you got for the next 12 to, you know, two years? Well, um, I'm going to probably, not in the not too distant future, I'm probably going to move out of this field of practice that I'm in. Um, I'm going to um, have a little break for a little while, but then I really would love to be able to, um, you know, be available for speaking events, um, motivational kind of speaking to any group really, um, but particularly women and girls, I kind of like, like to encourage them along. Um, I think that for me, that's that would just be the ultimate dream to be able to, um, you know, travel around the country, um, speak to women's groups, speak to groups, motiv motivate people to find their inner resilience, find their inner strength and achieve their life goals, you know. Um, and if if any of my life experiences can act as a as an example to others to, to walk away from such an event and think wow if she could do it then i can do it yeah then that 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 would just be so wonderful yeah absolutely and with your experience and like with you know all of your 30 odd years in social work together with your personal experiences that they'll read about in the book Yes. Uh, you know, to, for you to, to speak at conferences and things would be so valuable for companies and for businesses for you to, to do that because resilience is, is such an important skill for all of us to have um, and to tap into. And yeah. your, your book, you know, helps with that. So um, that's brilliant. Yeah, so that's my, that's my dream and that's my next goal that I'm going to work towards. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. And so how can how can anyone get in touch with you, follow you, get your book? Okay. Where do they go? Yep. So um, I have a website, which is just drannbutcher.com. Really straightforward. Nice and easy. We love nice it. And, <laughs> nice and easy. And if they go to that website, they'll get my, they'll get contact, e other email addresses and uh, the phone numbers and contact details. Um, they can also um, purchase a, a copy of the book if they'd like to from that site. So basically, if they just know drannbutcher.com, they'll be able to get um, in touch with me via Facebook or, um, you know, all those other social media means as well. Beautiful. And your book is launching soon? Yes. Um, we're having a public launch uh, on the 24th of October in Mackay. Beautiful. So, um, so is, is, can anyone go to that or is it closed yes. or yes. No, it is, anyone's welcome to go to it. Um, it's actually in a, at the Botanical Gardens. It's a twilight book launch. Oh, gorgeous. Yes. And, um, we're hoping it's 
So I'm actually doing it. Um, we're doing this combined book launch. I've got two other friends who've also gone through the um, Ultimate 48 Hour Author Publishing Company, and yes. they're all from Mackay. Yes. So we're having a combined book launch. Right. So I think it'll be. I think it'll be lovely. So yes. yeah, this, yes, it should be really lovely. And um, so yeah, it's it's in the park, so we can you know accommodate with with within a COVID safe plan, yep. we can accommodate up to 500. Not that we expect anywhere near that. But oh, you we... never know. There are people will be listening today and saying, I want to get there. <laughs> <laughs> but we can accommodate a lot of people. It's on the, on the tropical sun lawn um, on twilight with um, complimentary glass of champagne on arrival. Oh, so lovely. Yeah. The yeah. benefits of living in Queensland where it's a little bit warmer. I'm here today and it's raining in Geelong. Oh, I've got the heater on. <laughs> oh my goodness! No, it's really starting to warm up up here now. So, um, yeah, yes, it's it's still quite nice though. But yeah, I know it's going to be another warm summer. But anyway, that's what that's what happens when you live in the tropics. Yeah, lucky you. So, <laughs> for the guys, if they wanted to go to your launch, is that on your website as well? Um, I will put it. It's not there now, but I will put it on the website. Yes, okay. I'll put details. They can, get, they can access it and and they, uh, they 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 can contact me. They can just yeah. message me, and I'll send them the information. So there's a link to to message me on on that site, yeah. and I'll get them the information, all the details for the uh, book launch. Brilliant. Well, guys, those of you that are listening, make sure that you do that because it'd be great to get to the launch. Get to, then they could get your copy. Will you will you autograph it for them? I oh, definitely the will. <laughs> oh, definitely. Well, then you've got to get to the launch, guys, and you've got to go there so that you get an autograph copy. Yeah. Uh, so uh, <laughs> that would be brilliant. All right. Well, we're up to your JJ rapid fire questions. Are you ready? Oh, okay. For fun. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> the serious okay. part's gone. We're on to the fun questions. Okay. So, all right. We've got ten questions for you. Are you ready? Okay, yes. Okay. Best piece of advice given to you? If it was if it was that easy, everyone would be doing it. Ah, love that. Your favourite book? Angela's Ashes. Oh, I haven't read that one. Who would play you in a movie? Meg Ryan. Ah. <laughs> What's one thing on your bucket list? Oh, I want to go up in a hot air balloon. Oh, that, I haven't been on one of those. I'd love, to, love yeah. to. Yeah. If you could trade lives with anyone for one day, who would it be and why? Oh. Michelle Obama. I have such admiration for that woman. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would just love to experience, you know, her world um, through her eyes, I suppose. Yeah. Beautiful. Three words that describe you. Oh, um, I can be, I can be fun. I can, I'm passionate. Um, and I just love people. Beautiful. If you could have any five people dead or alive to, mm -hmm. who would you have? Wow. Um, that's a tough one. There's so many, um, <laughs> Or alive. Just got to think about that. Um, people like Mahatma Gandhi, I would love to have know him. Um, Barack Obama is another one, I suppose, because um, I have admiration for him as well. Um, I'm just trying to think about some of the amazing women in the world. Um, maybe, maybe um, Oprah Winfrey would be a great person to sit and have conversation with. I think. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think about you know wonderful Australian women. Um, oh, I'd really like to have a chat to Natasha Stop to Spoyer or yeah, um, even Julia Gillard. You know some of those women who've really been kind of trailblazers in Australia. Yeah. Um, from up to <laughs> so four. You know you, you, you got the five. I got five. Well okay, done. Great. Well done. Great. Great. <laughs> If you could have one superpower, what superpower would you have? Oh, I would just love to, um, there's so, so many I'm trying to think. I'd probably like to be able to, like, 
just trying to think, help help people as much as I could, but I don't know which superpower that would actually be. <laughs> um, probably, I'd love to have like limitless access to resources so that I could ensure that people who are living in poverty in other countries didn't have to live in poverty. Yeah. So, yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I don't know what superpower that is. That's yeah. <laughs> may, maybe magic. Enough, <laughs> maybe, yeah, may, maybe just magic. magic. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> And the last one is, what legacy do you want to be remembered for? Well, you know, I just like to hope that, you know, when I'm not here anymore, that there's people who, who maybe I've, whose lives I've touched who, who, who will be able to say, yeah, she made a difference in my life, that I made a difference. Beautiful. Well, you've certainly done that. <laughs> 30 years in, in the social work, uh, you know, arena, you definitely have done that. So thank you so much, Anne, for your time today. Thank you, Janelle. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited that, well, we're working together, so I'm really excited about that and to get you out on more stages and speaking and t talking about your amazing book and the resilience for, for women and for, for, for men out there. Uh, you know, I can't wait to, to see you out there on the speaker circuit doing more of that, helping even more people in a different way. Yeah. You've got all of this experience, life experience that uh, needs to be out there even more. So I'm really excited that you're going to be doing that. Thank you, Janelle. I can't wait, to be honest. I'm really looking forward. I'm actually really excited and I'm looking forward to the next, you know, the next phase of what I'm going to do. And, um, yeah, I just want to say thank you to you for giving me the opportunity to have a talk about it all to you in this podcast. It's great. Thank oh, you. My pleasure. Thank you, Anne. And, uh, yeah, those of you that are listening, make sure that you get on to drannebutcher.com. Is that correct? That's right. <laughs> And make sure that you get a copy of Anne's book and make sure you message her so that you can go to, if you're in Brizzy, uh, make sure that you go to the uh, launch that's coming up and uh, follow Anne. And, uh, and if you're any businesses out there and you're looking for a speaker, uh, we've got Anne waiting for you to yes. talk to you about resilience and about her story. Thank you, Anne, so much. I thank really you. appreciate it and um, I'll speak to you in the next couple of weeks anyway and uh, thank you for your time today. Thank you, Janelle. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Bye.